Yeah, yeah, but you, you know, yeah. Do it. You have taste in a way that's meaningful to software people. Hello, I'm Bill Gates. I would, I would recommend uh, TypeScript. Yeah, it writes a lot of code for me, and usually it's slightly wrong. I'm reminded, incidentally, of Rust here. R the Rust. Congressman, uh, iPhone is made by a different company, and so, you know, you will not learn Rust while driving. Well, I'm sorry, guys. I, uh, I don't know what's going on. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about large neural networks. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Rust. <laughs> data topics. Welcome to the Data Topics. Welcome to the Data Topics podcast. <laughs> Hello, hello, and welcome to Data Topics Unplugged, your corner casual of the web, where from LMs to research to whatever, anything really goes. Today is 8th of March of 2024, Women's Day. So maybe, can we actually get a quick round of applause to all the women? <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, I well before maybe the introduction is Women's Day. Before any further ado, as well, fun fact: honoring all the women in STEM and in tech. Actually, the Grace Hopper is Grace Hopper, right, Bart? Grace Hopper. Yeah, I'm asking, but I have it right here in front of me, so I know it's Grace Hopper. <laughs> uh, she created a COBOL language, which was one of the big things that laid the foundation for data processing and actually programming. She created the COBOL language. Yes, that's oh, nice. Right. The Nook. You didn't know that. I know it was the first compiler. She created the first compiler. Ah. I didn't know that was COBOL. Yeah, yeah. No, it was the first compiler. So actually, yeah, without with all the women in STEM and science, we wouldn't be here today. Maybe, probably not. So, you know, big shout out there. Today, the, the skills are a bit different. But yeah. Um, and who do we have today? Maybe I'll I'll, yeah, I'll let everyone introduce yourselves in a second. But I'll just say here, we have Thomas Winters, uh, NLP researcher, Kill Levin, specialized on LLM and creativity and humor. Um, I have also Peter here, uh, a good friend, uh, former <laughs> yeah, <laughs> student colleague. Uh, we pub co-published some papers and I'm oh, using wow. co-published very loosely oh, here. Uh, <laughs> look up your Google Scholar. Or... Yeah, I just have one. So, uh, but yeah, that's uh, Peter. I have uh, Peter did, let's say the heavy lifting there. He's also the guy that not only on NLP in uh, AI space, also in the real world space. He's also an expert holding a streak of over 2,500 days on Duolingo. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. Um, he specialized on state-of-the-art BERT Dutch models and uh, also like how the different languages play. Uh, LLMs is a very interesting topic, obviously. So I think today we have a very special episode with two people leading the industry there, the research. And the man, Behind the 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 sound engineer, you know the and ex sound engineer, ex sound engineer. We've, uh, now we have we've Alex. Uh, Alex on sure. keys. That's sure. He's the guy, you know, that keeps the lights on here. He's the guy that puts me in line. The ad structure, the man that I have nothing but love and admiration. Bart. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yeah, I think uh, last time too. You know, maybe this is a side note. I used to not never listen to myself and watch myself. I still have a bit of a hard time, but it's getting better. You know, sometimes I listen to myself and I'm like, oh, the joke was a bit off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's like, I just want to set the record straight here, you know? Nothing but love, Bart, admiration for you, you know? Oh, did you, was there a joke in the past? That uh, maybe, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Okay. But uh, yeah, Thomas, maybe we can start with you. If you would like to introduce yourself, say a few words, fun facts. What would you like everyone to? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so hi, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Keilöver, uh, specializing in creative artificial intelligence, building language models together with Peter and doing research on that, especially like how can we train computers to detect and generate humor. Um, and yeah, so I, I, we both just finished our PhDs um, a couple of months ago. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, you're on my website already. Okay, great. Yeah, I think a lot of people in Belgium might know some of my side projects, for example, Torusbot, which imitates Rick Torovs on Twitter, um, or X, but I, I, I prefer saying Twitter. Uh, <laughs> we've also got Improbotics Flanders, where we play improv theater with robots on stage. Uh, we've been doing that since oh, well, 2019, cool. 2020, something like that. Um, yeah, there's also plenty of other 
things uh, yeah this dog generator which generates completely random slide decks since five years ago if i think topic you want um yeah there's also i think like a tap on, on ai specific projects so these are just the main ones but i i play a lot of improv theater i combine a lot of technology with creativity in general uh, that's what i love that's what i like that's what i want to keep on doing really uh, really cool and i see some of it is in uh in english i guess and some of it is in Dutch. Yeah, so of it, like, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy doing the things in, in Dutch because it often proves that a, that AI can already do something for like such a relatively small language such as Dutch, right? So, I mean, like, if you see people that, that it's like, oh, look, there's this AI that can imitate this famous English uh, actor, like, I don't know, Snoop Dogg or something, then you could be like, well, is that because the AI is so good or is it because like someone did like so much effort into that because like replicating such a big actor it's worth spending thousands and thousands of dollars to it. But then if, if you're going to imitate someone as um, niche as Rick Dorf's or like uh, characters from, from TV shows from Flanders, then you kind of know like, okay, AI is probably mature enough because no one will spend thousands of dollars uh, trying to yeah imitate this, this particular person. Uh, so I really enjoy like almost as, as like a proof of concept or something or like really like showing the world like, oh, this is what AI can already do by doing like very niche uh yeah things from from uh, in, in dutch that's cool that's cool and again dutch is sometimes i have this question myself right like uh i'm also from brazil so i speak portuguese and i, I don't know i haven't checked the latest and greatest of uh, lms and nlp but i remember last time i checked the uh, stuff in portuguese was significantly lower quality right so and i also understand that there are differences in the language itself right the way the language is structured like maybe some there are some languages that are more complex to understand or not. So actually expanding to other natural languages is something that I I have curiosity there. And that's actually where your expertise comes in, right? Yeah, indeed. So um, I'm indeed focusing on training language models for yeah, partially for Dutch as well, together with Thomas, but also trying to adapt language models to different languages. Um, for Dutch, that's indeed quite challenging because although there is some data, um, it's typically not enough or we don't have enough uh, compute as well because well, we're also researchers working at the university. So then we try to come up with methods that deal better with that as well. Um, yeah, so that's part of my research. And then I'm also focusing on FAIR NLP. So trying to remove biases um, yeah, like gender stereotypes, gender biases in there. So uh, in the context of Women's Day, I think that's also a worthy mention. Very true. So, Very yeah. true. Um, maybe, so you mentioned like, well, maybe there are different ways we can actually go from this conversation. But uh, you mentioned your university. You don't have the same computational power than OpenAI has and all these things. That's mm -hmm. actually a question. That I could, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. But then you start seeing... Uh, yeah, like, okay, there's a new state-of-the-art model for NLP, but also it's because they're one of the only ones that have the compute. And I think it's like maybe five years ago, if you were asking like, where is this, the the research innovation comes, it's, it was going to be universities, right? But now I feel like because everything relies so much on so much compute, I wonder if this unlevels the playing field, you know? Like now, it's not like everyone has the same... Uh, opportunities right like if you have some very popular model or very new architecture that is very efficient but maybe you still need that computational power you still need this you will never get your moment in the sun kind of thing mm -hmm. is this do you feel like any difference or is like is this is this i mean i think that's true to an extent like um for for instance what i try to do is translate models so that you take an english model and then you can translate it to dutch uh, so it's a bit more advanced than fine tuning on uh, Dutch data, um, but you still need to have some compute. And mm. okay, it might be orders of magnitude less, but you still need compute. And, and those GPUs are still super expensive. And where do you get your compute for your research um, So we mostly have the Flemish supercomputer, oh. um, but those have, yeah, they have some uh, GPUs, but they're in super high demand. Okay. Um, so that makes like iterating over something very, very slow. Mm. Yeah. But it is something you need like quite scary. I think like 
uh, when you look at it, like uh, so much of the big large language models, if you want to train them or run them even sometimes, uh, it takes so much resources that it's like, get, yeah, it's, it's very hard to do research on and it only becomes harder and harder. You've got all of these million dollar startups and companies that, that are innovating in that space. But I think we as academics can still do a lot of, uh, well, research and contributions on like other original smaller angles, like something that a lot of companies might not dare doing just because, I mean, they have a bottom line to reach, right? They, they want to make profit at the end of the day. Uh, and I think like a lot of the, the, the cool things that Peter, have, for example, has been doing uh, is also like often sometimes on like something very niche or very small that then uh, helps a lot. And I think, for example, indeed, his recent work on token translation, where it's like, can we reuse a model um, that has been trained on one language and then just translate the tokens and use these embeddings already to then uh, have a base model, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's exactly. Or, right. or then also the fairness research uh, that, that he does. I think it would like you can do some experiments still on these models. You can train your own models. You can uh, to some extent still. Uh, and, and I think we're already lucky to have this much compute as a computer science department. Uh, I think our, one of the reasons that our Robert model, which we made four years ago, got so popular is because a lot of uh, people doing NLP are also in the linguistics departments, and they don't even have the computer we have. So they were very happy that we used some of that compute to then open source uh, one of these models, which was also, I think, one of the earlier models on, on Hugging Face. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, back then they didn't have, even have the Hugging Face hub, right? No, indeed. Like we... We, we even had, like, I think some of the, the main people from, like the leaders from mm -hmm. Hugging Face doing pull requests to our repository yes. to make sure everything was compatible. Yes. Cool. Yeah, really cool. And you mentioned also the token translation. Yes. I'm assuming that's this tick to talk. Yes, indeed. So yeah, we trained the last uh, version of Robert with that method. So we took an English BERT model, uh, yeah. Roberta, and we translated it. Can okay, you maybe more... explain like for the people that don't know what a BERT model is? Yes. The... So it's, it's a language model. It's um, typically used for um, classifying text um, mm -hmm. or getting embeddings out of it. So you get a representation of your text. So it's not a generative language model. So it's also a bit smaller. Um, but back then, that was quite a big model. <laughs> um, but yeah. So and what we do is we take an English one. So Roberta is mm -hmm. trained by Facebook on, I think, thousands of uh, GPUs. Um, and we translate that token per token to, to Dutch, and then we still fine-tune it a bit. But that works really well. So, yeah, we also... And how, how good can you map tokens from English to Dutch? It's, um, it's a bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> so but it works. It works. Um, <laughs> thing is, some tokens map very well. Um, things like uh, I um, maps to ik, uh, yeah. because that's in both languages. But then you start to get to tokens that are split up, and then it's way messier yeah. because they're not split up in the same ways. So what yeah. about the because the, I know in Dutch, like sometimes one word is just like the a compound compound words. Words. Yeah. yeah. Yes. How do you yeah. how do you manage that? Well, maybe explain what it is for people that are familiar. With so that. yeah, the compound words in Dutch are uh, basically all glued together. Yeah. Uh, like the same in German. So if you have seen those memes about German words who are that are super <laughs> long, like the egg breaker thingy. Um, what is the egg breaker thing? So there's a word like Eierschalen. Uh, ah, yeah. Like uh, my German is bad, so I'm gonna <laughs> stop there. Uh, but it's to break your egg. Uh, so it's like a like an, a device Ooh, a to, word, break, yeah. your, to yes. break your egg. You have Indeed. That, yeah? But so in Dutch we also have this thing where we yes. glue together a lot of nouns, mm -hmm. which confuses the tokenizer a lot, right? Because tokenizers, uh, especially like the PPE ones, they are trained to uh, basically as a compression algorithm, right? So they're trying to compress the 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 corpus that you're training on in a little oh yeah there we have it beautiful that, that, that's the word anyone wants to give it a try we have the the german word here on the screen actually uh, alex is uh german <laughs> 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 the bus passed by yeah, and yeah, it yeah. threw around i just saw an opportunity there i, I it. think it's uh go, go for it bart no no no. I really you can ask the brazilian of all the people I think that's <laughs> <the best. laughs> I make it a bit esoteric <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, an egg breaker. That's mm -hmm. that's what I said. <laughs> I don't know how to translate. So it's basically, a compound word. Yeah, basically, it's like a whole bunch of stuff glued together. Yeah, and you're saying, yes. like, yeah, and, and when when you have these BPE tokenizers, I mean, they're basically trained to uh, 
to compress the entire internet in as few tokens mm -hmm. as possible, possible right? So, but they completely disregard morphology, and uh, they they might split up word up in things that don't yeah. make sense and are actually not representing the the actual nouns that are in present in this compound noun. And um, one thing we 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 found when we were training our robot model four years ago was uh, when we just used the, the the English BP tokenizer that Roberta by default uses trained on English te text. Uh, and then we trained a model again, but then on one where the tokenizer was actually built on uh, Dutch, uh, to like a tokenizer that was built on Dutch text, so that it actually respected a bit more of the Dutch. But even it didn't even respect the the morphology of Dutch at all. But we found that then for several tasks that it needed way less data to get the same performance or even higher performance mm. than our uh, one that had an English tokenizer and also competing uh, bird models that we had. So. I think like one thing we we learned there is that like these tokenizers are definitely like under researched. Mm -hmm. I think like especially if you look at things like Dutch, where we have all of these compound nouns and other morphological things that that you want to have in there, and in a lot of ways like tokenizers are to me still like the Achilles heel, even in like GPT models, because like when you want to do rhyming or like uh, something where the syllable count is important, mm -hmm. and these models have such a hard time figuring out like how many, um, yeah, how many. The syllables or how many or how, how does this word even look like if there's hmm. this this joke where you can say like give me synonyms of uh, this particular word that start with this letter and then even gpt4 sometimes trips over what the first letter of a word is because it doesn't know what that token looks like oh. and and so there's like still like so much improvement that we can do on these tokenizers there's so many things wrong with the way that we have the tokenizers right now which are just trained as a compression algorithm to have as much text as possible in as few numbers as possible um that yeah it's it's weird that we and, and the entire world is going spending hundreds of millions mm. of dollars training them but like the models but not looking at like how can we build better tokenized for example respect morphology better or like these other constraints or things that languages have yeah i'm also wondering like if every time because i like morphology depends on the language you have right like yes. it, so does that mean that you need to almost start from scratch every time you go to a new language or well, you need to train a different tokenizer for a new language, typically, anyways. Like, that's... but what do you mean by so uh, training a tokenizer? Yeah, so you have your corpus, yeah. and then the first thing you do is you look which words or which subwords are occurring a lot, and you use those to train or construct your tokenizer. It's really just the most commonly occurring words and subwords get their own token until a certain threshold, and then after that, you start to represent words by using two subwords or three or okay. four so then like even the way you split I'm, I'm saying words and subwords because from at least when i looked into the tokenizers mm -hmm. in hugging face and whatnot is because they split word like translating they could split it between translate and then the ing yeah right? mm -hmm. so common uh, like so mm -hmm. but even the way that they split these things are also determined based on the data you have. So I guess yes. the ING is something that is very recurring. So they're going to say this is going to be a separate token. Yes, but but there might be, yeah. So sometimes it's something meaningful, like ING does mean something, mm -hmm. like it's it's conjugating a particular verb, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the tokenizer doesn't actually know any anything about the morphology mm -hmm. of the language. It just figures that out because it's like basically trying to compress a large corpus into as little numbers as possible. So it just finds the most common substrings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had one, so we updated our model to 2022 data, um, and then we tested for uh, like which new tokens are in there related to COVID. And there was one, COVID measures split up in um, Coron and Amatrielen, so Corona yeah, yeah. measures. Ah. Um, but like the the first letter of measures. Um, it was just. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's like, uh, there's also like this ugly artifact that you have because a lot of words you sometimes spell with a first uh, capital letter or sometimes without a capital letter. So there's mm -hmm. often like words where you just have like the, the, the word without the first letter because then it just swaps between the, the small letter and the big letter in, in the tokenization. Mm -hmm. so or with a space in front of it or without the yeah. space. So you basically have four variants of a word. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And these are like the, the things that all of these language models use, right? Because most of them use BPE. Because mm -hmm. basically, people made the trade off back when they wanted to tokenize, right? So you you could say, like, and if you want to, it's a BPE, byte pair encoding. And so, the, the, that's the, 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 <laughs> the idea behind it is you want to have uh, as much text as possible within your context window, right? Yeah. So you basically um, want to find 
ways of representing that text with as few numbers as possible. Mm -hmm. And so usually when we normally map uh, a, a text to numbers, we just say, let's use Unicode and we just encode every letter as a separate character. But that means if, if you have a context window of let's say um, to 256 uh, uh, um, tokens, for example, well, then, then you can only encode like a tweet's length basically, right? Um, and what uh, BERT did, the, the, the Google, when they made BERT, is like they basically encoded the most popular words and they gave all of these words a fixed uh, number. But then you only have like the top, for, 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 what's it, 40,000 words yeah, or something that's encoded. Like that. yeah. All other yeah. words are just like unknown token uh, mapped to that one. Oh, really? But then if you do that, then you have, for especially if you have like new words or like other languages, mm. you have just like unknown token, unknown token, unknown token, unknown token. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what's yeah. the, the, the middle ground between these two, between encoding letters and words? It's just like saying, well, let's find these most common substrings and we give them a number. And so that's why when you, when you use GPT, for example, they always say like you get so many tokens back just because they don't reason in words, they reason in parts of mm. words, these, these substrings. Uh, and it's pretty interesting if you look at how text is tokenized, like it doesn't follow the the things that we do. For example, if you encode Gothic, I believe it's like G uh, O O T H and then ik. So it's like, yeah. it's like three and it's like not morphological making sense. It's just like, but it's like, because O T H is probably like a very common token. And mm -hmm. I see at the end is also like a, <laughs> a common token, but it's like this, this middle ground that they had to pick because either, either uh, you're going to have very little text that you can input, or you can have a lot of unknown tokens. Let's do this middle ground, but this middle okay. ground, because it's basically modeled as a, as a compression algorithm, like how can we get as much text as possible? You're going to get that these weird artifacts where where these these words are not, yeah, ma making more philosophical sense. Yeah, so then is yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So basically, and then also once you, after you have the tokens, you still need to come up with an embedding for the token. Yes. So right. that's the training the language. Model yeah, and part. then you still need to do that. And then after you have the, the tokens, I guess you still need to train the machine learning model. From yeah, the, that happens from... at the same time. So yeah, you have yeah, the, yeah. you train the embeddings uh, yeah. that are mapped to the tokens and you train the entire language model at the same time. And maybe when you say embeddings, do you want to explain what that is for people that never heard the term before? Sure. Um, it's um, basically a list of words. So, uh, of, um, or a list of numbers that represents your um, your word or your token. Yeah. Um, and then with a language model like BERT, you can uh, use an embedding to get um, an embedding of, from an entire sentence, which is nice. Yeah, the reason I also has this is uh, I came across this article that I thought was interesting. Uh, basically, it's embeddings killing embeddings. And basically, mm -hmm. they're just saying, it's a bit of a forced segue, but anyways. Um, <laughs> basically, they're making the comment here that embeddings confuse people. And I think nowadays mm -hmm. with ChatGPT becoming so popular, like everyone is talking about embeddings, um, but he, like embeddings has a, a, a meaning in English, right? Like to put something in, right? And then mm -hmm. that confuses people. That's, that's what he, that's what the argument here is, right? And that doesn't happen when you say prompt engineering and when you say fine tuning, because these words are more accurately represent what is, what are they saying, right? So I think the example he puts here is like, the knife was embedded in his chest. Right, so embed in the sense that like to put in, right? And then when we talk about embeddings now, it's really just saying like we're mapping a word to a sequence of numbers that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're embedding a particular word into a space, space. right? Space. Yeah, in, exactly. Into a vector space, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, so basically- what, what would then be the correct way to? He, so the art, the, actually I think I'm saying he has yeah, Steve Jones. This guy- You're confusing he's, me. He's proposing, uh, instead of using, no, embeddings is the correct word. But he's saying like, for us, that's fine. But whenever you're talking to people that are not in the field, so okay, most okay. people that to are- make it a bit more intrinsically in, or intuitive. To exactly. Yeah, yeah, and okay. then he mentions that should be, he, he will propose something like source translation because you're translating from English or natural language to machine. But that, that just sounds like you're doing a translation task. That's yes, even more confusing. I agree. From that's... the source and what is the source then? <sighs> asking a lot of questions. Because you can go to the embedding, but from the embedding, you can go back to the words. True, but I guess it's like you can say like uh, actually, I actually have no idea. I, I don't. Maybe we're getting too caught up because I think what his main point is like you're going from a machine representation, something that the machine learning models understand, yeah. to something that is natural language that humans understand. Yeah. And then he says, well, he defends that if you were to use this terminology, it would be less confusing for people that are not data science space. But I mean, if you're going to use source translation in natural language processing, 
then it does sound like you're doing a translation task, which mm -hmm. makes it even more confusing. Yeah, I think for us, yes. I mean, I think when you say, if I say like there's a, mm, I guess yeah, maybe, maybe like you know? Im image embedding, then exactly, I guess. But isn't uh, what was his name, Steve? Yes. You're not trying to solve something that is not really a problem. I mean, I never thought it was a problem, but then I read this article and I was like, maybe because they also say, well, if you're in the field, you know exactly what it means. Um, so I never really thought of that. For me, it was very obvious because we've been talking about <coughs> it for so long. But, uh, and I actually never had an issue when I was talking to someone that is not in the field and I say embeddings and I explain what it is. And they're like, oh, that's so counterintuitive. You know, I, I, think, it's fine. I think I still need to explain what the source translation is. Mm -hmm. That is very true. Yeah, and, and it's usually in his article, he's also confusing things a lot by intertwining it with prompts. It's like, doesn't, yeah, no, doesn't have... no, I think he like what it, well, I nobody is like return the sort of information to prompts and stuff. It's like, you can have embeddings without. True. But maybe it made me think one thing I do have a bit of an issue with is the word AI, like to say artificial intelligence. Oh, that, this is, uh, this is <laughs> a very good topic. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like the name. And that, that's uh, I want to hear what uh, everyone thinks. <laughs> just, just say that. Is this no. your hot take for today? No, no, that's not my hot take. I will, I will have some hot okay. takes. Um, but I guess it's just like I don't like AI just because I think it invites the conversation, the whole sentience, the whole intention, the whole wills and desires. Because when you say artificial intelligence, people really think it's like a little robot that gets sad, that gets happy, that wants to do this and that. You what, know? what is your alternative? Uh, I would even like even if you say like pattern pattern or oh, statistical pattern I, I don't know Somebody. that people might argue that it's not really statistics right because I had this discussion with someone recently and I was like ah oh, why do we don't call it like automated statistics but then it's like yeah but statistics is actually cleaner because in, in AI <laughs> it's, it often feels like we're steering in a pot until what uh, about like outputs come out, right? pattern recognition something something but then, but then you're going very neural because, like, if you look at logic and reasoning and these kind of things, they're all in AI. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing pattern recognition. I, th I think AI is not necessarily like the term AI is not necessarily a problem. I think that, like, because it's a very, very, very hype domain that there's a lot of vagueness. Like, what is AI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's predictive models. There's a bit of the statistics. And, and the, I think the annoying thing about AI is maybe like the moving goalpost part of it, right? Yeah. Because like if you look at a couple of decades ago when you were doing breadth first search and depth first search to solve games, then people were like, "Oh, this is AI." Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the thing is, as soon as we understand something well enough, it's like, "No, no, no, we we, we don't call this AI yeah. anymore." Like, and I, if you have the decision tree, it's like, "Oh yeah, but I can understand this." That it doesn't. That's not AI anymore. Like I. But then I feel like even like with neural networks, like we get to basic ones. And it's like, oh, just like a one-layer neural network. I wouldn't call that AI anymore. Well, it's only one. Yeah. So it feels like we're always defining AI as like the thing what that's on the border mm -hmm. of what we can understand, yeah. and we're constantly moving like what what this is. I think with uh, ChatGPT and all these large language models, because they're so big and like they're black box, you know, it's like it's really hard to really see how you, if you tune this, this happens and this, that happens, you know? And I think because we don't have that very clear view, then the AI argument becomes even more, you know, because do you say you really understand how all the knobs and whistles are working there? And you're like, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, but you it, have an idea. But, but, but is it important that a human understands? But that's the thing. Because I don't understand how your brain works, but I can still call you intelligent, right? Well, <laughs> I'll well, take maybe that. I... You heard it here first. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but uh, but I think it's like yeah, because the deep blue example, right? Like the chess, like you know, they said one once we beat the best chess player, that's AI, right? And then they did it, and then it turns out it was just like breath search or depth yeah. search, whatever. Just Basically, like... just kind of explore all the possibilities. You have a very powerful computer that can try everything. 20 moves ahead and say, well, if you do this, you're probably going to be in a better position later, right? So it's like you say, okay, that's not, okay, that's not AI because it's just brute force, right? You, but it's very clear. Like you can say, yeah, it's doing this, this, and this. And if I had a pen and paper, I could do this if I had all the time in the world. Yeah, but you, if you want to, you can do gradient descent and stuff by, by, by pen and paper if you have all the time in the world. So True, but I think it's like with ChatGPT and LLMs, it's like, the argument is not as clear, you know, like, because if you say like the black box, you know, and it's not explainable. And then it's like, well, if you don't know how to explain, but it's doing these things and it can, like, if I say, hey, do this. And then it says, oh, don't, don't be rude to me. He's like, oh, maybe that's a real person there, you know? Yeah, or if, but it, it's also just predicting the next word. And, that, and that's the thing. And... I, I feel like AI invites more that discussion to the conversation. And I think if you just say, well, just predict the next word. So it's mm -hmm. not really intelligence, right? Because again, and I agree with your point, huh? 
AI is such a hype term that is, everyone is thinking, everyone's talking about it. And some people that don't really understand how it works are just talking about it. I actually was in a PyCon in a conference that the guy, he was going to do a talk about AI on the blockchain. And then he started talking about AI in free will and how the model shouldn't be censored because it should have, they should have free will because if it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. So I don't care. So we should model free will. Like really, exactly. Like it was like, and this guy was in a in a conference. He submitted these things. He's like, uh, he runs a, like, like, and it was on the blockchain. I think so. But like, I mean, that already discredits. Uh... To be, but to be honest, like I didn't even like we didn't even get to that because he's like it was very like it was it was yeah. Weird. But I, I mean, it's nothing new that people project a lot of personality and things onto AI, right? If you look at, for example, even Eliza, uh, 20, no, sorry, I'm sorry, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. the, Eliza, the, the thing, the chatbot that sounded like a yeah, from psychiatrist. The 1960s. Exactly. So that's 1964. So, uh, I guess, yeah, so 60 years ago. So then people were already like projecting. I was like, ah, oh. oh, look, look at this thing that can think. And I mean, that's nothing new. And, yeah. and I don't know if changing the term AI will really change yeah. that, but I do get your point that intelligence is such a loaded word. We don't even understand intelligence ourselves. That's also a problem with computational creativity and creative AI. It's like, what is creativity? What does it take for an AI to be creative? And I'm just like, my, my general idea is like, if it contributes something of value to someone's creative process, then that's enough for me to call it like creative AI. And I think the same thing with with just AI in general, like artificial intelligence, if it does things that help in some intelligent task, or maybe like even does it itself, then to me, it's fine to call it like intelligent. But let's go there then, like uh, for creativity, right? Like, so you yeah. mentioned that if it's something that helps you be creative, then it is like, it would. So let's imagine I have ChatGPT and I'm trying to write a book and I say, ChatGPT, this is the setup. Give me 40 different ways how this story can go. And maybe I won't even take it and copy paste, but maybe it's like, oh, that's actually a good idea, but maybe I'll change this and this. Would that fall in the space of creative AI or for I, you? I would think so, yeah. I mean, for me, it, it, it is just like creative AI is whatever is helping you in a creative process. And I mean, the, the, the level of automatedness <clears throat> in that process doesn't really matter too much to me as long as there is a bit of automation, then it's fine to call it creative AI, in my, in my personal opinion. No, but that's um, fine. Uh, but also, and how do you, we, so your, your research is in that area as well, correct? Yes uh i think the thing is a bit tricky also with lms and we talked about this before it's like how can we say this is better than this and even with lms it's tricky right because mm -hmm. we see the benchmarks like with the i mean gemini uh, ChatGPT, this mistral right like there was a lot of them and then it's like they have a lot of promise but then we try and it's like not sure right and it's hard to quantify it. yes yeah i think when we talk creativity especially that's that always been like th this has been the bane of my yeah. whole phd it's like how do you evaluate creativity yeah. right it's like all of the all of my colleagues were doing nice quantitative ai methods and then they just check if the numbers match up with what is predicted but in creative uh, like creative ai whenever you generate something you sh you probably should somewhere in your experiment test it on humans right yeah. so how do you like you just have someone reading jokes from an ai and then you see how many how much people laugh see so the decibels um, and just <laughs> <clears throat> I mean that like that, that would be meter, like, yeah yeah that yeah would but that would best, that, that yeah. would be probably like the best way yeah. of doing it because like it's very hard to to fake laughter right so then if you have the decibels that's great but that would be quite a big setup so um usually what we do is like here's a joke rate it or maybe here's a couple of jokes which one is your favorite okay. or which one do you like better oh, and okay. then you can compare like uh, if I have two separate joke generators like which one is better the one with or without a particular component or maybe it's like you pick your best generator and then you pick a human uh, and then they write jokes and you show this to other people and it's like which one do you like better what uh, if we talk about humor yeah uh, in AI what is, what is the state of the art today oh um I I recently did, a, did an experiment myself where we found that improvised jokes so when you give humans a challenge and it was like even comedians doing the challenge mm -hmm. um and you make an AI improvise a joke, then the audience thought it was pretty equal. Like humans have really? like a slight edge, but yeah. So we that's like a study that I, I, I'm still working on and, and it's, not, it's not published yet, but yeah. we did it with a live audience of like 40 people and it was pretty similar. Um, but like it, it's it's pretty big but leaps. Maybe it. like, so just the dumb details on there, like is it just someone reading the joke or is it like, are they, do they just read it on text? Because I also think it's like, so a lot of the times in the joke is the delivery. Mm -hmm. right yeah so in this case we had comedians re, uh they they all had the challenge and they had to bring one joke themselves and one from uh okay. and, uh that was ai generated by me behind the uh, scene and the, the others didn't even know that ai was involved they just had to uh rate the jokes 
and then in the end we told them uh, and then uh, we we saw that yeah about like 30 percent of the times they were uh, uh then the ai was better than the humans and then about 35 percent of the times humans were better and 35 percent of the times they were equal so it, wow. humans still are a bit better but it was like it was pretty close on so if you make people improvise a joke so not give them all the time of the world to write just like an ai doesn't have all the time to to write it also mm -hmm. has to do it immediately then uh and, and is this the, the thing you used to generate the joke no no this this is this is uh 2017 so that's already seven years ago that i did this this was for my master thesis back in the day uh, um, how do you generate jokes um so in here or no in the in the example you were mentioning uh, the then we were just using gpt4 but with some clever prompting strategies okay. because you you need them because uh, when you ask gpt to write a joke uh they're generally pretty bad yeah um, exactly yeah there's this fully uh, agree <laughs> it, yeah if you just say like please write a joke about, about uh, lawyers or something then 20 then in 90 percent of the times so you'll get variations on the same 25 jokes hmm. there was a paper showing that it was pretty interesting so it might just say like why did the lawyer cross the road uh kind of yeah. thing then right L L let us try this but wait why, why did they cross the road <laughs> don't leave me hanging just, well, just to get to the other side uh, but like okay. it's, it's like <laughs> the, but that's the thing like these these ai models and and like gpt4 is getting pretty good at it but it's like still pretty bad but like a lot of ai models they're just well picking up patterns right and and you can tell that when you ask for a joke in even like in all generations of of, of ai that we've seen over the past so many years um, you get things that are pretty good at mimicking the structure of a joke, but not really the punchline of a joke, something that makes it funny. And the reason for that is, is, is quite simple, right? Because when you, when you, when you tell a joke, um, people laugh because there's like a, uh, a world model in their mind that makes a switch yeah. or a jump, right? So, uh, if you take the joke, like two fish are in a tank, says one to the other, do you know how to drive this thing? Then up, up until the word, like, do you know how to? You might think of like the fish being in an aquarium mm. but then if, you, if i say the word drive then your mind suddenly is like oh this doesn't yeah. make sense yeah. you can drive an aquarium and it jumps to um to fish that are in a military vehicle yeah. and you have this with so many jokes like if you have a bun you have two interpretations if you say something sar sarcastic yeah. uh like there's so many like i mean so much so much of, of a joke is just like jumping from one frame of reference that you have built up into your head to then realizing like oh no this is wrong so slightly panicking and getting a new yeah. world model and then the release of, of of this tension by just laughing that away mm -hmm. but if you want a computer to to make a good joke it has to kind of realize that there's these two frames of references that humans can jump from and that's often very hard because well if it's a too easy of a jump then we don't laugh because we saw the joke coming if it's too hard, like if it's like a very difficult connection, like say Wikipedia pages are sometimes like linked with three clicks away, but you have yeah. to go through very obscure knowledge. Well, then we're also not going to laugh because we're just going to mm. be confused because yeah. we never jumped to the second world model. And so in a lot of ways, like humor is like an excellent test bet of like AI, just because it's like, if you really want to do like humor in general, like for all types of humor, and you want to be able to generate these kind of things, well, you're going to have to have a lot of functional equivalents that can kind of estimate like is this not too easy or too hard you need linguistical capabilities you need cultural references you need like yeah there's all these kind of capabilities that you need for a proper joke uh and we just saw like for the for the past so many decades because like uh, the, the first real computational humor systems were back in the early 90s a lot of these systems were quite bad and like at best we could get like uh, half the frequency of of uh, human funny jokes mm. um so like yeah if, if humans make so many jokes and half the frequency of that uh, a computer might match it but then that's if you particularly hard-coded for a particular type of joke yeah, right. uh, uh so for example like uh, i like i like my relationships like i like my uh source open that's like a computer generated <laughs> joke where, oh, really yeah yeah but like i don't know like or yeah. i like my coffee like i like my war cold <laughs> and that's like from like a paper from 2012 where yeah. they just for that particular pattern they just learned relationships between yeah, yeah. The three uh, things and also something I, I extended in the in the, in the and do you have uh, prompting tips? Yeah, so so I think uh, we see a lot of these prompting guides floating online online right where it's a lot of ones that are pretty weird. Where it's like take a deep breath uh, and yeah. like and uh, you have to give it a tip. But like like when you actually validate these kind of prompting strategies, a lot of them are just good for some tasks but not for different tasks. But I think there's like the the, the big three one that you can use to basically uh, help automate 
almost any task, right? So there's the the, the few shot examples. So if you just give a couple of examples mm -hmm. of what you want to solve or what you want to generate, like GPT is very good at picking up patterns. This is how we had to prompt engineer before we had the, the GPTs that could follow instructions. You just gave it a lot of examples and it picked up on the pattern and then it, um, yeah, basically imitated that. So giving examples, always great. Then you have the, the chain of thought or like splitting complex tasks into simpler ones. That's always something that helps a lot. So the the, the, the basic trick would be like, um, you say like, let's think step by step or, mm -hmm. or you give it some examples. That's even better if you can do that. Give it some examples where you say, given this input, I have these reasoning steps and then this is the output. Um, or what I do a lot for for humor is like, well, when you write a joke, so I do play a lot of improv theater, I teach a lot of these techniques. Okay. Uh, and if you actually teach these techniques to, to the AI, where you say, given that you ha get a, a headline of, of, of something in the news, well, something you can do is first uh, analyze what the topics are about, like two topic handles, so mm -hmm. to speak. Then you can say, well, let's find some connections between that in a second step. For your third step, uh, write a couple of punchlines that you think might work here, given this link. And then for your final step, select the best okay. punchline and then write a setup for this punchline. And if you do that, then suddenly your joke quality gets way higher okay, okay. because mm -hmm. suddenly you're not asking for like, please give me a joke and it just mimics it with like a pattern yeah. and it fills in some words into a pre-existing joke. It will actually like do some brainstorming steps uh, okay. before. Are you so, going to try something, Bart? Can we try this live? Uh, sure, yeah, but, but then you might have to uh, write uh, several things. Are you going to um, you can, you can share oh, my screen? Share. There we go. This is live. Uh, can we? Uh, can I give a topic and you give the prompt to? Uh... Uh, sure, but I'll, I'll I'll need to type a lot. So uh... okay. Whoa, whoa. And there's a, a third trick also. Uh, a, a third trick, by the way, that I forgot is um, giving context, right? So if you give context of like what is the task you're trying to solve, or preferably you're gonna say like uh, you're. Oh no, this is pretty. It's gonna go great. <laughs> you're a, a world. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. While Thomas is struggling, I guess I can also say something like the um, uh, chain of thought prompting. So there you really ask, okay, let's think step by step. Mm -hmm. You need to do that before you ask for the answer, okay. not yeah. the other way around. Otherwise ah. it will give a wrong answer, uh, or hopefully a right one. But uh, it like a language model generates a token one by one from left to right, right? Uh -huh. So if you then, uh, first ask it to generate the answer it will only use what it has until then and then ah. afterwards it starts seeing okay i gave this as an answer why and then it, it just invents something ah, interesting. Um, because it also doesn't know why it generated that that was just the most likely thing so if you first ask it to reason it can look back at that reasoning understand that reasoning and hopefully that reasoning is oh, correct Which I feel and like... then it uses it for classification or something interesting i feel so... like it's the opposite of what i usually do when i'm sending emails usually i just put exactly what i want and then mm -hmm. i try to give some context because if i put it at the end i i found that people don't really look over like i think people like people's attention span it goes from like paying attention in the beginning and then like okay less mm -hmm. okay less and then sometimes they don't even get to the end that's a good point yeah. so yeah. i actually like i actually yeah. had a, i had a class in the us like on uh english for engineers that they were like the, actually the class was interesting they talked about big disasters in engineering like the rocket that exploded and how communication was a mm -hmm. big issue there and the first thing she says is like always put what you want in the beginning and then see mm -hmm. why i did that a lot with you bart as well because i know you're a busy man you know so it's mm -hmm. like yeah i usually put like Hey, can you do this? And it's like I tried doing this. I'm thinking this, this, this. But like usually, I always start with what I want. But I'll, I'll have to. It's uh, not smart on Slack, eh? What do you mean? So you Slack it for internal communication. Like if you start with what you want, and then you have a whole explanation. I'm only going to read the last line. Yeah, because the input yeah, is at the bottom. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so you're like chat GPT. That's then. why I don't <laughs> never do what you want. <laughs> Man. Wow, live. Can you uh, see that? Uh, Seems like it's not fitting on the, yeah. the full full image. Can we have a look at that? Can you fit it somewhere, one way or another? Can I? <laughs> or is it maybe just a, yeah, the... there it is. So, oh, but... but also maybe a question. Uh, maybe also to so everyone. Can you base any uh, headline into this? Headline. Yes, or I, I now made one for, for headlines. Usually what I would also do is add some examples where I say, given this input, I would follow these reasoning steps. And then there's some output. Um, I, I do writing notes about news headlines. Um, Make a news headline. Ooh. 
like just anything. Yeah, anything could be anything from a news, something that you might want to talk mm -hmm. about, or like uh... a Dutchman walks into a bar. Oh no, no, but it, it is... <laughs> not, <laughs> not a punchline. That's uh... <laughs> so maybe Marilla. In the meantime, you need to uh, uh, ah yeah, explain maybe a bit maybe. what. Uh... So right now, for the audio people, uh, we're on ChatGPT four. We're doing this live, so we're not uh, liable for anything that the the model spits out. Um, Basically, there is a prompt there. It's an initial prompt saying, you're a world-renowned expert on comedy with a proven track record in writing jokes about news headlines. Maybe just a side comment. I don't know if we mentioned this particular, but I do know that just by telling ChatGPT or the model, you are an expert on this, usually the output is significantly better. So Yes, and that, 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 that's what I mean, like providing some context, but then the best kind of context is saying you're an expert because these models have trained on the entire internet. Yeah. And if you say, please write a poem about something, something, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm stretching the truth a bit, but then it's it's like, well, I've seen so many poems online. I'll just give you one of these random ones. But yeah. if I say like, no, no, you have to pretend to be an expert, then it kind of finds like the room where it's like more expertly written poems rather than an average yeah. poem on the internet. Very so like in reinforcement learning from human feedback during the training, uh, when OpenAI did that already made the kind of quality kind of already better. But like in general, that's like why you want to like condition the model often on these kind of things that push it towards the more interesting spaces of. Uh... Yes. So uh, maybe it's a quick tip for people using ChatGPT, which is everyone. Um, so that's <laughs> that's one thing. And then afterwards, there's whenever you write a joke, you follow the following steps: select topics in the news headline, write a list of these links. Uh, write a list of links. These topics from step one you can have. Write all. Write a list of punchlines related to these links from step two. Select the funniest punchline from step three. Write a setup for the punchline from step four. So basically, it's like a step by step. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And then the input from Bart. Yesterday, Murillo, a famous podcaster, found a drunken pink unicorn on the side of the road. His interventions were able to save the poor unicorn's life. All hail, Murillo. But if I understand you correctly, you need multiple headlines here. No, no, one, one is okay. But okay. like what I would usually do to get At even least. higher quality is say like, here's some inputs that you might get and then some reasoning steps that I, mm. as someone who so comedy, would, would follow. Some examples. Yeah, yeah, and then, so now I explicitly wrote the steps here, but what I usually would do is give reasoning steps for that particular type of input. Yeah. Uh, so this this might not, uh, this is not the best prompt. I, usually my prompts are a page or two. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Like this is this is getting the general idea of like you, you give some context by saying pretend to be an expert. You're giving it some steps, and this way, instead of it having to immediately solve the the problem on its very first token that it generates, you're saying take it easy, take it slow. You can have some draft paper and write out some steps, and then okay. you can use these intermediate steps to, cool. to write a joke. So now, if you press save and submit, we should be able to. Um... Let's see. Let's see. Drum roll. Do we, we don't have a drum roll sound, do we, Bart? No, Alex, no. Sorry. Maybe next maybe next time. So now what's happening is the ChatGPT is actually writing down the steps from the before. It's actually like it says step one was this and, and then gives some bullet points. Uh, it's a lot to read, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> it's a lot to read. Uh, maybe you want to read it, Bart? I don't know what to read. Uh, what should we focus on here? It's written to that. So if we want to put the joke together, yeah, 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 you have to you have to just look at uh, the last, step. yeah, because normally you 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 can also add a step that says then write out a full joke. Yeah, for the full, uh, for the, the should probably done that. for the people listening, like the the output of ChatGPT is now giving all like it's processing all the steps and giving output on on every step, and now we can ask put the joke together. Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. let's try. Let's but it together. should be just if you read step five and step four, then then yes, you can in a joke. But we're not that advanced in humor. Eh? Yeah, no, we're talking to we're just humans. humans here. Eh? We're just... <laughs> Why did the pink unicorn argue it wasn't drunk? It insisted it was just tasting the rainbow, not drinking it. Do we have the crack, crack, crack? <laughs> <laughs> That's something. Yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Let's take this one too. No, but I, I think what happened here in this case is I should have said that it was should only use two main topics. So that was in step okay. one already that I messed up the problem. But, but, but it's tricky. Yeah, I think it's like it gets very complex. I think it's very mm -hmm. interesting how 
you're almost like breaking it down the science of humor, yeah. which I think is also very. Uh, but it takes a lot of inter iterations, right? Which yeah. These, uh, yeah. Like so the, I, this is a very good example of this is the first iteration, and then you start start improving on that. Huh? Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. I have a question as well. I feel like not for not because I'm like this, but sometimes jokes can be can play on stereotypes. And stereotypes, mm -hmm. if you push it a bit further, can be. Were you triggered by the pink unicorn? Uh, <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> but if you said like, "Oh, Murillo's a Brazilian guy, and he," I'm sure that's something borderline not nice. Okay, would come out. May come out, and I think it also taps in your fairness. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like fairness joined with humor. We've talked a lot about it, but we actually never did something about it. But it's yeah, just measuring fairness or how how biases are in language models is already super tricky. Um, and then mitigating it is even more challenging. Like you saw what Google tried to do with the image generation that went, yeah. yeah. Like then it just went completely to, yeah, fair images, but at some point it's not fair anymore, but it's difficult. Huh? Yes, it, it's difficult. Maybe, could you explain what that was from Google just yeah. for the people that- yes. So uh, Google made an image generation um, tool in, I think it was in Gemini. 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 And they, um, yeah, people started noticing that they added some stuff to the prompt so that it generated uh, more um, racially and gender diverse uh, images, which I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but then that was applied to everything. So it was applied to, um, when people ask it, medieval or uh, Vikings, um, like those were not the Vikings that actually lived yeah. in in the 12th century, or popes. Like there is not a single uh, black pope or, a, or, or a female pope, but then it starts generating that. Which, like at some point, it becomes fiction, and that was what people were concerned about. Yeah. Also, I, I, with this bias, sometimes I have a hard time. Like for example. One thing I get not so infrequently is like, oh, you're Brazilian. Oh, you must play football. And I'm like, wow. And he does. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, right? But it's like, but then it's like, it is it is a, a bias, I guess, like stereotype, right? But to a certain extent, like, for example, like we actually, the last podcast, we're showing some image generation and we're like, it's very fast. And if I type like Brazilian, either women were going to show up with like on a bikini yeah. or something like that, you know? And it's like, like when we say Brazilian, when we say Italian, when we say this, you have an image in your head, right? And it is a bias, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way you do, you don't want to just an image of a person. But it is a bias, but maybe it's a correct representation of the things but, that are but, but straight, is it, right? Is it the correct representation though? Because I think a lot of like in AI, there's a lot of amplification of, of these biases, mm -hmm. right? Because an AI usually, when, when you train it, it but i mean a correct yeah. representation of the training data i That's yeah but, I mean. but, but but then even still like what well, for example when you look at uh vae's training on amnesty images right amnesty images they are black and white mm -hmm. uh hand-drawn digits but then if a vae generates again like through the bottleneck like an image again you get like grayscale uh things mm -hmm. that are not present in the in the data set why is it generating these grayscale ones because these are the average between black and white and and often ai models are stimulated to be as close as possible mm. to a particular prediction so you're averaging out uh, a lot just to have more probability yeah, if it's yeah, white or if it's black point. you're still yeah. quite close so i think like in a lot of the cases the problem is with neural networks the the probabilities mm. i get out are not actually calibrated with reality mm. like you get like uh for example this gpt says like ah. Oh, I'm I'm so like so much percent convinced of this next token. That doesn't mean that that is actually reflecting the the reality of the training data. Just like when it's when it predicts that token, like yeah, then then it's most likely to be correct or something. So so it's more like fairness in LLMs and AI is more like you want to like if the curve shifts to the right, you want your curve to shift to the right, but not more than it should be. Not but more than what you actually see. That's a bit depending on what you want to do as well, right? Like if you, like we work with the Flemish Public Employment Service and we have a data set of resumes. And what you don't want is that you have a model that says, okay, this is um, the resume of a nurse. And now I get the resume of a computer scientist or of a man and, and just uses the link uh, between 
female and nurse to to then just classify all the resumes of women as nurses and then uh, of men as computer scientists yeah and i think that's not like, what you want yeah i actually saw i heard maybe i should fact check this that uh, amazon also used some ai to mm -hmm. screen cvs mm -hmm. but then they would screen yes. out women because yeah training data oh. mm -hmm. but it's like and i completely agree that it's wrong we should not do this right mm -hmm. um but at the same time it is on the data that they trained it on probably yeah and that's why you want to be conscious and do exactly. you, do you mm -hmm. want to correct for these things so i guess it's like yeah. it's, it's like and i think that's what google was trying to do with gemini yeah like you want to yeah. add some some and, and it's interesting that they got a lot of slack or like a lot of issues uh, for that online because OpenAI was doing the exact same thing with Dolly 2 when it came out, yeah. I think two years ago. It's the exact opposite. Yeah, no, no, they, they did the exact same though because they also added to the prompts, like whenever you create a person or like, for example, if you edit, if you said, please generate me a, a yeah. CAO, uh, then you usually get uh, white males, but then at some point they fixed it and people were like, oh, why is yeah, that exactly. impressive? They fixed and then, it, yeah, yeah. But then, but then the, the, the fix, was just that they added exactly. whenever yeah. there was a, a, a job or a person being mentioned that they just added black or woman yeah. or these kind of things yeah. to the prompt and people exposed that by saying a person holding a sign that yeah. says and then you got signed yeah. like people holding a sign that just says black or woman and, and they did the exact yeah. same fix that gemini did namely adding yeah. things to the prompt but then it's interesting that so many years later this, the exact yeah. same thing happens and then you and yeah. before that the they got flack for the opposite reason like what mm -hmm. you're saying like if you generate a, an image of a ceo it's always men yeah and mm -hmm. so it's good that actions are being taken right because that's not what we want in society and the, the gemini is, a, is an example where maybe it went a step too far yeah so um, maybe uh also is this you mentioned the cv screen is this what you're talking about uh yeah so this was a tool that we built based on those resumes partially um mostly because we noticed that a lot of the resumes in there were not very well written um so yeah, this is not screening resumes, but this is trying to help people write the resumes. Um, we still have a TZ student working on this, um, but yeah, it's still work in progress. But yeah, the idea is just with GPT and with um, resume Robert, as we called it, to generate um, outlines uh, that map to what a resume actually should look like, and then give some suggestions for skills. What I what I notice uh, in our own job application process at Adroots mm -hmm. is that nine in ten people today for a motivation letter use ChatGPT, yes. and it has become completely useless. Mm -hmm. Like because it's so generic, the wording like it's it's very clear and doesn't come from the person anymore. Mm -hmm. That it's also like they, you lose a little bit of authenticity in these things as well. Uh, how much was actually like? Yeah, how much value did the yes. motivation that you normally have? Yeah, well, was it not just copied from like the last 20 applications that they did uh, and then changed the... Uh, well, but I think there's not a discussion. I think there is a fair point, but but uh, like what is the value of a motivation letter, mm -hmm. right? But what you see here is that because everybody uses ChatGPT and suddenly everybody has the same. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think you have the, the same danger when you talk about resumes, that you have this Which... becomes bland and everybody... But expresses it in the same way but to be fair like these are resumes for people working or not working and having trouble finding a job uh, who are enrolled at vdrb and a lot of these resumes don't have any information at no all. no this is for indeed so, for your specific point yes. but i mean more in global mm -hmm. i think in global we will see more people starting to use this for i just came out of school i need a resume let's yes. use ChatGPT for it yeah but, but, I but think... if it's an accurate representation of what skills you have why why shouldn't it be yeah you're democratizing yeah. the skill of resume and i think for resumes it's still like very concise information which has to be accurate it's easier and yeah. i think indeed like one issue that you see is um the when you generate something with gpt like uh, you get these long texts where you don't have to put effort in so one thing and i think that might even be a good thing for society is the the devaluation of these long complicated texts there you go. so yeah. and and i feel like we're, we're kind of finally making it more efficient maybe for us because now we're we're more valuing valuing these kind of bullet points so i can imagine that maybe for your next motivation letter around at data roots you might be like oh please write us a bullet point list of things why you want to work here rather than 
putting these bullet points into ChatGPT and then yeah. having to go through all of the noise in there that it adds with all of these favorite yeah. words of GPT that are very recognizable. But I think the, the main thing is like the motivation letters is clearly people that just say, write a motivation letter for this company, mm -hmm. you know, and then just give some information. So there was no, nothing really personal there. Yes. Right. And it's like, if I, if you write the same prompt on ChatGPT, yeah, the words would be a bit different, but mm. you can look and it's like, yeah, oh, I would like to go to Belgium because of this vibrant community and because of this and the history. Like, it's always the same stuff. And I think if, and again, I, I maybe I wouldn't take as much of an issue if someone uses ChatGPT to say, hey, include this information about me. This is exactly, my favorite yeah. project. Mm -hmm. These are the things that I'm interested about. And then even the person reads and see if it makes sense or not, right? I think that's more of a fair game, but I think what we saw is like it's it's the same but it's but it's a good filter for you guys right if, yeah, yeah, if, yeah if you see that it doesn't have any th things in there then it's an easy way to filter mm -hmm. and i think we're getting to this to this very weird point in society and i think that might be the inflection point of like inverse compression right so like usually as computer scientists we're like trying to compress data in a small thing as possible but now we get to the point where people write a bullet point list of things they want to say they say hey gpt please write this as a longer email you get these long emails to the people's mailbox and the people get, receiving a lot of mails are just like hey gpt please summarize these mails yeah. for me and now you get again these bullet points but kind of skewed out of it so we're kind of like making the data larger and i think at some point we'll realize like hey maybe this interpersonal this these quick lists of points um it's more valuable and maybe the motivation letters can just be like a motivation paragraph with a lot of bullet points where you say yeah. what are your actual reasons of getting here you don't have to compliment belgium to to in order to be hired here right yeah i put mm -hmm. a joke i saw a while ago it's like with co-pilot i think it's very relevant it's like there are two people in front of a computer on one side and it says hey i turns this single bullet point into a long email i can pretend i wrote and on the right side is like hey i makes this single makes a single bullet point out of this long email I can pretend to read. And it's exactly. Like, yeah. It's a bit like, yeah, we can just cut the... Like, exactly. Just, exactly. And I think at some point, like, we're already seeing the devaluation the embedding of... Embedding in between. Oh, <laughs> 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 ah, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I but think but I, I do, when we talk about creativity, without something like this, without Gen AI, I have the feeling like there is more diversity in creativity. Well, now everything like you would go by default to a Gen AI solution, like would be a text speed, images, be whatever. And this becomes like 80% of what is out there. And it's very similar to 80%. The 20% is real authenticity, which is, I think at the same time, like gets a higher value, which is also good. But like you get less of a distribution in that 80%. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's, that's dangerous, right? We're, we're all gonna sound like ChatGPT and, and, and these kind of AI models that are just averaged out and... But, yeah. uh, but I think, I, I don't know, I like the value, when, especially when you make your own bots that kind of sound like you or like a particular yeah. character or for a particular task. I, I have like these, these custom GPTs that you can build them on. I'm so addicted to them. Like I, I like the value as well. I, yeah, I use then, it a lot. And then you can actually make it steer away from these yeah. default ways of, yeah. of sounding, right? So for example, uh, for the humor prompt that we just saw, well, I've, I've got some that work really well on improv theater and then it doesn't sound like GPT mm. would normally sound and it actually takes on a character and yeah. uh, and improvises along and then it doesn't sound exactly like ChatGPT or these kind of words that it prefers. But then of course that takes more efforts and I think indeed like a lot of people will sound like the vanilla unprompted, yeah. just simple instruction, please write a, a motivation yeah. letter and then we all sound exactly like ChatGPT with yeah. uh, beautiful words like the advent and culmination of <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Accelerating. Yeah. Delve into. I had this I had this university where they screened the theses and they found particular words that were suddenly <laughs> tenfold uh, more used in abstracts right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because ChatGPT just likes these kind of words. Do you yeah. have any insights uh, be on humor or on uh, on uh, bias fairness on uh, Claude's uh, no, Anthropic's new model Claude two? I've played with it a bit, but maybe Pierre. I looked or, at or the, the research paper, but that's actually about it. Like. Yeah. It's interesting how they um, like they basically went out of data to train on. So they did a bit with synthetic data, but then I tried to find something about that. They don't say anything. No, not a very so, yeah. That's yeah. what we see, right? So all of the language models we've we've used up the entire internet, mm -hmm. uh, and the internet is only getting worse because everything is getting generated on the internet nowadays. Yeah. Um, so yeah. like everyone is turning to these synthetic data sets oh. uh, and. I think like what we see in Gemini papers and Claude's papers and stuff and, and OpenAI's papers is just they they keep emphasizing like the 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 quality of data matters so much and like getting that filtered out or or making your own synthetic data sets. Mm -hmm. I believe OpenAI hired like so many of these uh 
programmers and not just to help program the AI, but just to solve programming exercises and tasks uh, so the model could could learn better from real people. Um, and I think that's the reality that we're kind of hitting. It's like we, we've used the internet. We have to kind of point to either making new data sets or synthetic data sets. You see everyone training on things that were generated from other AIs and mm -hmm. then filtered out and rated and ranked. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I heard a while ago the people were discussing whether AI has poisoned its own well because mm -hmm. they released the models and now there's so much AI generated content. And it's like if I go to ChatGPT and I write a blog post and I change some things, but it's still 80% AI generated and I post it, yeah. can they use it to train my model? Or are we just going to go, are we going to all slowly average out to the noise mm. of AI? You know? Yeah, a beautiful example of that was uh, Grok from, from X. That was um that was saying like no mm. i cannot do this task because of open ai policy yeah, just because yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then they said well we didn't train on, on gpt output but of course on the internet there's articles yeah. being written that also include like this goes against open ai's policy like even on amazon there was like this thing i don't know if you saw this where if you google i, I don't know if maybe they've they've scrapped it off now but like if you went to amazon and you searched for um so uh, as a language model i cannot then you find all, a lot of products that just uh have these in their in their text that that was just clearly generated by mm -hmm. the company just of the text without looking at it. It's just like sorry, as a language model, I cannot generate a description for this chair or something. Is this this? Might be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I am um, just tried out your joke generator on Claude Three. <laughs> I, okay. Uh, so it's exactly the same prompt. Um, I did it on Claude Three Opus, which is the biggest one, biggest model. And it gives the breakdown of the different steps, like we just saw on ChatGPT, uh, but it also immediately gives a joke. So oh, okay. that's the last step. Yeah. The setup and final joke, it says, in an unexpected turn of events, famous podcaster Marilo rescued a drunken pink unicorn from the side of the road. Sources say the unicorn is now recovering and is expected to be a special guest on Marilo's netball next podcast episode, Confessions of a Drunk Unicorn. I like that better. <laughs> Can we have that? better, right? Yeah, something better. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's also something beautiful, like about all of these language models, these prompting strategies, the big three, right? So the, the few shots, the chain of thoughts mm -hmm. and the giving context and with like role prompting and stuff, they, they keep on working between all of these language models. It's not yeah. just like a trick that Indeed, yeah, isn't yeah. one of them. Like people have validated these yeah. against like uh, the, the, the Lambda, the Llama, the, the GPT, the, the mixed role, mixed role, all of them. And they just keep working as, as long as your model is big enough like chain of thought works like for the smaller ones it doesn't pick up very yeah. well in the chain of thought but like yeah. you can just copy these prompts over and i think that's maybe also something where where we're going towards where in the future for example all of our phones will have a default large language model that your your browser can interact with just like just like if i don't know if you noticed like the web speech api in the browser like you can do text to speech and speech to text by mm -hmm. just calling a variable in javascript that's okay. already like, and then it just uses whatever the browser provides for that service for like converting your speech into text and and also voicing whatever text you you wrote. Uh, and I think in a couple of years we'll probably have these kind of large language model interfaces in browsers and apps maybe that that they can then use. Um, and and the fact that these prompt strategies work across all these models is is also like well, if every phone has their own language model, then and and they and these prompt strategies work on there well that's probably good for the future so that not every app has to install its own language model or like keep on calling the cloud uh, for these kind of access and i think we'll probably not see it in the, in the next few years but, but i think that's where we're going towards uh when these language models get stable enough trustworthy enough uh, stop mm -hmm. hallucinating a lot and get them small enough to be on the phones uh, that will just have these kind of APIs just like we have for uh, text yeah. to speech and speech to text. There is a, when we talked about it a while ago, there's the App Rabbit M1 that is like a phone redesigned for like large, large action models, they call it. But yeah, you mentioned the future. Maybe we can, we already passed our one hour mark, but predictions, future, NLP, LLMs, you mentioned some things, maybe long term, near term. Yeah, I think one thing I mentioned that just large language models becoming like standard services and standard APIs and maybe mm. chips that just run these large language models for your phone so that mm -hmm. they can run with lower resources and just like only run that particular language model. So not a general chip, but like, uh, I think that will probably be happening, but that's way down the line. Yeah. Uh, right now we're seeing this cheapification of, of, of creation. Like we'll see, yeah. uh, I think like, just like we had word arts back uh, in the early nineties and two thousands where everyone was turning their 
their text into beautiful word art uh, that, that now looks very dated. I think a lot of the things uh, it's, it's really retro again. Eh? It's like it's cool again. It's cool again, yeah. But he's trying to make it. He's put, he's leading the movement. To <laughs> make word art great cool again. again. Huh? ASCII art is even cool again. Uh, ASCII art is cool, but it is because TUIs are cool now. Also, something that language models struggle with coming up with new ASCII art just because of the tokenization. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, sure. But I think like. It, it's great for like your local spaghetti uh, party and 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 great for your theater shows that you can now have proper graphic design rather than someone going in paint and and, and drawing something. But I think we're, we're, we'll be increasingly more sensitive towards these cheap generations because like if a big corporation uses these generated Maybe, images yeah. without any edits, without any like it signals to the to the people like, hey, we don't take this project serious the, enough to have a graphic designer, there, right? Like if yes. you scroll LinkedIn or or X and you see an, yet another Gen AI generated image, you immediately yes, just, exactly. Just mm -hmm. over. Like the, the the Willy Wonka experience. I don't know if you saw that in the news. Like they also had, like there was like a failed. Uh, uh, a thing, uh, but but then when you went to their website, it was also full of these generated images. So it, I, I think as big corporations, it's it's like you can use them as in your design process and maybe as a mood board and and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But if you are going to just plainly generate these images, especially if they have spelling mistakes because these are not very great at text, or or if they have like so much detail, and then if you look at the details and the details are wrong like that already triggers to, to the consumers and to people like oh yeah. well you don't care enough about, about this project enough to take your branding seriously so we're going to see like some interesting dynamics there with like the cheapification or like the the cheapness of all of these yeah. these things well said mm -hmm. peter Any... yeah what i think like lots of more personalization is going to happen like yeah we if you go on on facebook now like half of the content that you would see there is is already way more personalized and i think that's just going to become more and more like audio books at some point i can imagine being just generated for you yeah. if you want an audio book about i don't know what you're going to get it i can um, just say uh, i want uh, snoop dogg reading harry potter yeah like if if you want oh, that, that you, yeah you just had that example on the tip of your tongue mm -hmm. i feel like you've been, you've been waiting for this moment you're like ah. every night he goes to bed yeah. from the moment i wish, uh, yeah. I wish uh, was it 2016 open ai was created you're like that moment i had this is what we're going for <laughs> but <laughs> start think, the clock but it's a logical trend that we see right so, mm -hmm. so so many decades ago we had tv where like everyone watched the exact same so shows and you could talk with people about what mm -hmm. you saw and then you had youtube where you could find your niches and like resonate with a lot of people yeah. that had the same interest um, and you could talk a bit less about the general people uh, that you had in, in real life just because no one was watching the same YouTube. And then we have these TikToks and the shorts and the reels and stuff that kind of use all these AI techniques, recommendation engines to really push you towards your niche where you have very little overlap with even your best friends might be on different niches on TikTok. And I think we'll just see that trend continuing with completely generated yeah. things where, where it just generates things based on your uh, taste or, or your, and I already find myself having this urge. So because, for example, when I play Dungeons and Dragons, I usually research like what's what's in this uh, world of, of Dungeons and Dragons, and it's often like, oh, what do I want my players to to have there? But with GPT, I've made these kind of bots that just what what will these characters and yeah, it knows yeah. because it, it always links to my characters like what can they do in this world and it gives me these large texts and i'm really like ah oh, this is so so much to listen to i would rather listen to it while doing laundry or stuff like and then mm -hmm. that's basically an automated podcast that i that i feel i already have the urge of 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 listening to uh, and i think that that will probably be something that a lot of people will more and more have just like we find these kind of niches in tiktok that will just mm -hmm. find these kind of niches in in something that is completely generated for us and we might not have anyone to talk about it uh which is a scary thing right yes. like a lot of the interactions we have are about like okay the latest game of thrones episode and how bad it was or whatever or like uh, when we were children about yeah. the, the shared things shared experiences Indeed. Right? and if that completely disappears like imagine as a parent you're like you put an audiobook app next to your kit, and the audiobook app optimizes how long your kit stays uh, yeah, silent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's a very nice thing for a parent, I guess. But, like, suddenly that kid will never hear a story that one of his or her friends mm. hears. But, yeah. it's a, but it's a trend so, that's already happening, yes, right? With all yeah. the, the whole TikTok movement and, and the mm -hmm. recommendation engines that push you towards. That's true, yeah. 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 I don't know if I have if mixed feelings about this future as well. Yeah. But I do agree that it's. Uh, it's a viable future. Um, 
I don't know if I have time for hot takes parts. I think uh, you you tease me a little bit that you uh, with the idea that you have a hot take for today. You didn't want to tell me what it was, so Fine, I don't see. think we could skip on it now. <laughs> my hot, you, you, did you see it before? Or no, no. My hot take. It's my personal hot take, and I'll stand behind it. Is that I have a strong belief that soap in bars is better than liquid soap. And uh, if anyone disagrees with me, you know where to find me. Just leave a comment. And what's your reasoning? Yeah. Um, just, just, how did we get to this? <laughs> how did we get to this statement? <laughs> well, I mean, it's just better. We don't, yeah, but why? Well, do you agree? That maybe let's start there. I, I, I think yeah, it's less, less hygienic, right? Because it's like, less. Yeah, because everyone touches the same. Yeah. But it wears like, all. It wears off. It wears. You can say like, oh yeah, everyone touches the same bottle. Same thing. Yeah, okay, but afterwards you wash your hands under the water with the soap instead of like a soap that could literally be dropped no. in the mud but, and still be brown from the mud. No, but I mean, why is it better? It's better. Okay, so first, I feel like it lasts way longer. Like if you have a bar of soap, I it's gonna I last longer yeah. than if you have liquid soap. I think it's more cost efficient. It's I mean more it, environmental. I friendly. also think it's more environmental friendly, cost efficient for sure. It lasts longer, just like lasts longer. And I also think a bar of soap is probably cheaper than a bottle of soap, I guess. Probably. I also don't like how sometimes if you have like a puddle of soap and then it's just like the water hits and it just like you have to, the whole chunk just kind of slips off your hand, you know? Um, and uh, so I don't know. I feel like so I had the when I use liquid soap, I still use it. Okay. Just to no, I'm not uh, like bad against it. You know, I'm, I'm open minded. Um, if it like I don't know, it's it's weird. I feel like it's like I have to put too much, and then it's like it doesn't feel like it's really clean. You know, I feel like bar soap is like I'm way faster. You know, boom, done. I agree. I see what your point is, but I still don't. I I see where you're coming from, but I have to strongly disagree. Uh, I also think you can also travel with bars of soap, no problem. You know, you can take it anywhere. You're never gonna have to travel with a small. Uh, yeah, but then like, liquid. but then you have to either buy a small thing because if you want. You know? Yeah, yeah. Never been in a uh, yeah. Interestingly enough, the last argument that you're fighting over is the first argument that GPT doesn't make. Uh, what? <laughs> because the first ones that you just listed are all just made by GPT. So. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're all starting to sound like <laughs> that GPT. Uh, uh, you clearly asked it to to this one. Uh, to... Yeah, no, because uh, in Brazil also, like people use more uh, the bars of soap. It's very normal. And uh, I've been places in Belgium is one of them and I feel like I received certain you know attention friction due to that what well, what puts you in situations that people notice that you're using bars of soap versus well no, you, soap? it's not like people notice <laughs> <laughs> like they're just, I don't usually shower in a group setting let's just say okay. that um but when I mention it you know it doesn't come up often but when it comes up people look at me like I'm not from here which I'm not but you know, this is like a it's, it's like a topic like like do you uh, do you sit down when peeing or not? Oh, don't even <laughs> get me started on those. I think we can discuss this another time. But um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I just want to set the record straight. I'm a bar of soap kind of guy. Okay, I'm flexible with the bar of soap. I kind of feel like this whole segment is just like an excuse for something that happened earlier today or something. No. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> People said like, is that a bar of soap in but, your but pockets? I'm also or... honestly, completely lost. Yeah. Our, our whole thing. So <laughs> always have something to do with, with data. <laughs> no, no, I just I just want to switch things up today. You just wanted to make this uh, yeah, yeah. this argument. Yeah, exactly. this statement. Yeah, I feel like I was uh, maybe shy. What makes yeah. it you're so passionate about this? I guess it's just I'm just I'm just stubborn actually. That's that's the real thing. Okay. You know? Yeah. So I just want to put here on the so, record live for everyone to hear. Thanks for sharing this. Imagine with if the you're world. just scrolling over LinkedIn and you <laughs> put on this live stream. <laughs> this, this guy arguing for bars of soap. Yeah, but now you know. Maybe I should put change my LinkedIn title, you know. Bar uh, of soap lover or something. What is Maybe, your ideal size bar? Well, uh, <laughs> Do we have options there? I don't know. I don't mind. Well, you, you have the small hotel ones that you get for free, but then you have like the huge chunky bars. Yeah, but I think the hotel ones, usually they're cheap, right? So it's like, you, it really dries up your skin. Not not a fan. Oh, wow. There's also different... Uh... Of course. 
Jesus, this guy. Okay, <laughs> let's leave it at this. <laughs> Only thing better than a bar of soap is one of those like 71 shampoos, you know, it's like shampoo, conditioner, soap, laundry detergent, you know, remove stains. That's the, that's the best. That's the, when I was a the student, seven, man. seven in one. Exactly. I it's mean, like... what a stereotypically male <laughs> yeah. way to end the podcast on International Women's that's Day. True. <laughs> yeah, sure. Maybe we should change it on a different note. Maybe, uh, <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. If we... <laughs> Uh, maybe I should have kept this one for another day in retrospect. Um, maybe where That's the learning we take away from today. Yes. Um, some people stumbled upon, uh, can see the details. So maybe I'll just put it on the screen again. Peter, thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, thanks. Peter, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. You can find out more information about Peter's work on peter.ai. Uh, are you on X? LinkedIn, yes. all these things. Um, yeah, like my name on LinkedIn and yeah, my name on X or Twitter as well without uh, any space or underscore thing. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks for the invitation. Yes. And also thanks, Thomas. Nice to be here. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. S and and then you have also again your uh, personal website there as well. Feel free to check their work there. You also on LinkedIn, Twitter, all these things. Uh, yes, but sadly, my name is uh, less unique than Peter, so it's Thomas underscore Wind on Twitter. Wind. Okay. So without the last three letters. Yeah. Are you the Mastodon and all these things? Are you guys on the Blue Sky Mastodon? I have accounts, but are people posting on there? Because I... I don't know. Is it? No, you have like a hundred unread messages yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I kind of wish that, that it was more like. I'm Feder hoping for Blue Sky. And... I'm hoping for Blue Sky to become bigger. Yeah, but but it feels like the market is so fragmented. You're mm. never going to get like it's a big winner out of it now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's very so, sad because yeah. I really liked the the whole research hub on Twitter with all of the researchers being on there, but it's it feels kind of drained now. Mm -hmm. All right. So now what? Uh, Shitter says thing. <laughs> yeah, indeed. That's where the people are. Huh? Yes. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to the listeners. The intro. Thank you, listeners. Yes. See you next time. You have taste in a way that's meaningful to software people. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Gates. This is where they talk about a limb, but slightly different. I would, I would recommend.